Sumeru has been a fantastic addition to the lore of Genshin Impact, and today, with Fontaine finally rearing its fantastic head around the corner and we're about to see the preview to the land of Hydro, I think it's finally time to sit down and talk about the last final moments of Sumeru by giving a full review of 3.0 all the way to 3.6. So today, welcome to the final thoughts on Sumeru, and this is going to be a fantastic review and a compilation of all of my feelings and just my general thoughts on Sumeru as a content creator and it has been a fantastic year well almost a year considering that this nation has given us so much improvement to the story to the world to the amount of content that's been present and I'm really excited for what's coming to Genshin Impact so today we will be talking about the highs and the lows of Sumeru in general and I hope that you stay tuned but before that I just wanted to announce that I'll be going to Conquest 2023 this year year for one two three days so if you're going to find me you're going to need to look for a venti a hyunjin and a kindred specifically um maybe i don't know i actually don't know where my cosplays are and i know that two of those wigs are broken anyway i'm going to be breaking this video down into my personal thoughts and my personal review if you don't agree with parts of them that is perfectly fine you can have your own opinions and thoughts on sumeru because it has been a very 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 long time and we begin first with the production of sumeru sumeru had a very weird transition period from inazuma because it became the five week model and as a content creator i know that's going to sound really weird but oh boy that felt fast what i love about that is on one hand we are getting so much content rapidly that it's almost impossible to finish the current content of that patch and on the other hand that's going to just be a nightmare you know lore uh, video essays don't get shot out of the asshole but at the same time i'm so happy that sumeru started off very very strong with a very concise yet consistent speed of production and with that we continue with the arcan quest the arcan quest was mwah. I think out of the Arkan quests, especially for Mondstadt and Liyue, and especially in Azuma, I love the Sumeru Arkan quest. There are a lot of improvements that are very palpable and tangible in the way that they dealt with the Sumeru characters that are present and the way that the story just flows. Now, there are going to be some empty spots here, in my opinion. I think that there are certain threads that were pretty loose, and I do think that some elements of Elazar and the utilization of Dunyarzad and Kale were kind of lower than I thought it would be, but overall, the Archon Quest was an amazing, amazingly executed piece of narrative. It starts us off very strong with the introduction of Tignari and Kali, and they both introduce us to the concept of the Withering, Chekhov's Gun Principle. Very, very good start and shows us the stakes of what could happen to Sumeru if we don't intervene with whatever's going on. The thing with Sumeru is that it never started off with a very ominous tone. It wasn't like Inazuma that had the Vision Hunt decree immediately told to us and that people were kind of suffering in the background. This one is more of a gradual show that people aren't completely fucked, but there's something underneath Sumeru that's boiling, and if it explodes, things are gonna get really bad. And I'm really happy that they introduced us to stakes really early so that that's going to be fresh in our mind. And then we transition from Tignari and Kale to the citizens of Sumeru City, where we meet Nilu, Dunyarzad, and Dia. I think that the amount of time we spent with Tignari and Kale, Tignari most especially, is sufficient enough to, for them to be considered as characters. One problem that I actually had with Liyue and Mondstadt was that we didn't spend a lot of time with Amber, Kaya, and Lisa. We just had three quests with them and they kind of disappeared to give room to Jean, Diluc, and Venti. Same goes for literally one cutscene with Xiao and then we find him in the final quest. Kind of like that. I'm happy that Tignari and Kale became characters instead of just plot points. We go into Sumeru City and the narrative for that one with the Samsara, with Nahida, with the mysterious divine knowledge capsules with Dory and Alhatham. I genuinely thought that at first they're going to have 
two very convoluted story plots that just get mashed up together but in my opinion i genuinely think that they did really well transitioning one story to another story. We kind of begin with the introduction of the Akasha Terminal and the Divine Knowledge Capsules, which transition really, really well to the concept of using the Samsara Cycles through the Akasha Terminals. So it's really nice to see that the Chekhov's Gun Principle of the Akasha was, well, <laughs> was used. A lot of things in previous Arkhan Quests, especially in Genshin, are they're just introduced for the sake of the lore, and then we're never going to really see the fruition of their introduction and they usually lead to a lot of fetch quests so anyway but we don't have that for that and let me tell you the story quest in the very beginning of act one was super good i will always always hold the samsara cycle with my heart and in my opinion i think it kind of ended a little weirdly because it was nilu all along but in the end it was still a fantastic integration of the characters it was a really great show of characters and the people that needed to be front and center were front and center. Nahida was introduced super early as being a very competent god despite her unfortunate circumstances. Yes, she is super depowered but she is doing what she can for the time being and that was also one of my bigger problems with A as a character during the Inazuma Arkhan quest. She was too much in the background as this ominous godlike figure. Nahida on the other hand felt a lot like Venti's execution where Nahida is a very active role in the story and I'm really really happy about that because Nahida is one of my favorite characters in all of Genshin impact and I think that her characterization is super good. Great Archon means great patch. <laughs> great region. I, I believe that. Now the Archon quest in the desert was kind of a mixed bag for me in my opinion. I played the Archon quest of the first part and the second part almost congruently. I think I only had like a few days of transition between both of them but in my opinion I think that the Archon quest of Sumeru was still pretty strong. I think that it's really, really good. The Elazar Hospital has got to be one of the creepiest places if you read the lore, and I absolutely, absolutely loved just Dia's character in general. Though I do think that Sino and Dia are kind of push the bit in the background, but that's perfectly okay. And I really, really like that we had a perspective from the desert people, and this patch dedicating a section to them was so important for you to kind of villainize or antagonize the people of Sumeru City because while we do know that they're kind of dicks, we there are a lot more social structures that kind of hold the separation between the desert people and the forest people, which got tested in Act 2. But then we get into the fantastic conclusion of the Arkhan Quest, the whole fight against the Balladeer, and the wool reveal of Dothora's in-game model, and the heist to rescue Lesser Lord Kusanali, and it is one of the most satisfying things in anything in Genshin, and I will tell you this right now, the entire backbone of Sumeru was this heist, the Harbingers, and this whole collapse of the institution, well, the internal corrupted institution, of course we do know that the Samir Academia is still alive. The buildups of the previous acts were just so big that if this didn't correlate right, oh boy. And let me tell you, it fucking slapped. One problem that I had with the previous Archon Quest was that the characters just go through a rotating door of relevancy. And then they just have a more kind of background role in the, in the end. But Sumeru, man, each of the important people, the people that had to play their part, played their part individually. And I am so, so happy that the Nation of Wisdom outsmarted the bad guys and then got outsmarted by the bigger bad guy, but that's perfectly fine. Anyway, I am so happy that they showed us the individual parts of the heist and how it was actually executed instead of fading us to black like certain parts of the other Archon quests. I'm glad that we got to see the conversations. I think that was also a really, really great show Oh, no telling seeing Dothora talk to Nahida talk to Tignari Tignari talking to Sino or what Nilo is doing it is such a great character building moment that I'm so happy and I'm so glad that Hoyoverse learned from their mistakes and that culminated with one of the most fantastic endings that have a bit of loose threads in my opinion but nevertheless it just feels super satisfying to see the people 
earn the title of being a team effort against the Balladeer. I think a Samsara fight with the Balladeer is absolutely perfect, by the way. It ties in the loose threads of the Akasha Terminal, the Divine Capsule, and the Nahia's power as a god, and it shows you just how strong she could potentially be. But with every good story, there are going to be some eh, parts where I will be very truthful and honest about. I think Sumeru, for its very, very long length, this is the longest Archon quest, no doubt. I do genuinely think that they tried to put in a bit too much information in the last part, but that criticism I think is more so for me personally as a lore content creator that wants my information. I think that the way that the Archon quest did it was perfectly fine. Eldotor as an antagonist was kind of in the background, but Honestly, the main perpetrator here was the balladeer, I guess. Ildatore is just doing what Ildatore does best and just kind of see what happens. Don't fuck around and find out. All in all, I love the Sumeru Archon Quest so much, and I think that while it does have a bit of its inconsistencies, I know it's a really long story, and they were very ambitious, this Archon Quest for me is a solid 9 out of 10. Now we have the characters. Now, if you notice this in Genshin's website, for example, each of the nation is designated several characters and they have their own classifications. Not all characters that are within that classification are part of that nation, by the way. There are times that Tartalia is considered as a Liyue, like under the Liyue category. A more consistent example of this is that Wander is considered a Sumeru character, even if he's originally in Azuman. Another good example of this is Mona. We have no idea where she's from but she's considered a monster even if she just moved there. With that, I'm going to be talking about the Sumeru characters and how I personally like them. I love the Sumeru characters because I had a very, very bad feeling about them. Now, if you play Honkai Star Rail, and I know that it's not really a good idea to compare games because they're both from Hoyoverse, I'm going to be doing that anyway, you're going to notice that there is a difference, for example, in the way that characters speak. Liyue characters have a lot of words and they're very flowery with their vocabulary and their syntax and instead of saying I'm tired, they tend to say I have expended all of my energy for the day so hence I will rest. But the characters of Sumeru, while they do have their moments of very long dialogue, they actually feel closer to Mondstadt characters where they're much more relaxed. I, I don't know, it, it's the vibe. It's the vibe of their dialogue and just the way hearing Kale say cringy is just really funny to me. Sino with all of his jokes and his deadpan attitude. Kave being Kave and Farazan being Farazan. <laughs> it's like the characters in Sumeru, despite being from the Nation of Wisdom, are given more room to be human. I, I, I can't explain it. I really love the atmosphere that Sumeru characters have because they feel like actual people that I could vibe with. They feel like tired college students. But anyway, I just think that Sumeru characters have a very good reflection of being intellectuals, but also being people that enjoy just the simpler things in life. I will tell you this right now, I am super duper biased. Yes, very, very, very biased. Though I also want to say this in terms of characters and gameplay. Sumeru's characters have been one of the more controversial ones, not only in terms of culture, the whole debate on Twitter was uh, very evident of that, but another was because of their gameplay state. And while Dendro was such a very strong addition to the game, there are some problems in Sumeru's fundamental characters that cannot be ignored. Number three is the background lore. Now, as a lore content creator and as someone that loves the lore, I will say this with my utmost sincerity. I haven't been the most in tune with the lore of Sumeru, but I know for a certain that the lore of Sumeru is extensive, long, very, very vibrant and colorful. Obviously, they put in a lot of things for the lore people, but I do admit that there's some inconsistencies in their lore that I won't be naming right now, so I'm perfectly fine with it. I think Sumeru is one of the most condensed and massive pieces of lore, but if you're not into that, then you're not into that. That's perfectly fine. Number four is the world and the references. Now, each nation in Genshin Impact has their share of cultural references. This one, though, was kind of difficult. And I'm not someone that wishes to speak for the people whose cultures were used as inspiration by Sumeru, but I will not say that I am not blind to the issues that were posed there. 
I had a lot of moments in the story where I just went, whoa. And I think that Genshin kind of bit off more than they can chew with the amount of references that they took to numerous cultures. And I think they're going to do something like that with Fontaine as well. If I'm not mistaken, there's gonna be French and English inspirations for Fontaine. But I think that Tamaru is massive and my only disappointment for it is that there's a lot of sand and now I know that a lot of the expansion is because of King Deshret's story being one of the more long-term stories that will get revealed like you know how there's an Archon quest for the main forest city now with the release of other expansions they're gonna focus on King Deshret and the people of the sand and the goddess of flowers so I can completely see that but I do wish that they had a bit more forest areas to work with like going underground and seeing the things underneath the pyramids were absolutely great but the overworld of the desert was just empty or at least like a majority of it most of the important stuff from the desert happened underground number five is the music i am massively in love with inazuma's character music like character songs like la senora's beats were just so good but sumeru was able to uphold that and no doubt the music of genshin impact continues to be fantastic now we move on to the things that are very important in genshin impact and that is the gameplay state now the rate of resin and the spiral abyss didn't really get changed in Sumeru. Now, while I praise Sumeru for all of its amazing world building and characters and Arkan Quest, I do think that Genshin is still being stared down by this big problem when it comes to gameplay. And unfortunately, Sumeru had this really unfortunate idea that more is always good. Now, in terms of lore, right, that's perfectly great. But in my opinion, there is only so much that world quests and lore based stories can do when i heard that the aranara quest was around 20 hours i was just like no so in my opinion i think that sumeru didn't really tackle any of the important parts of genshin's well genshin's end game the things that are considered end game are still not there i don't think that they introduced anything except the tcg and here's the thing i will consider genius invocation and Genshin Impact the same way that League of Legends considers teamfight tactics. They're two separate things and two separate forms of gameplay. The people don't play Genshin Impact for the card game and I am one of those people. The thing is that the constant minigame loop in the events continue to be a very unfortunate state of Genshin Impact and you can definitely feel the burnout and when it returned to the six weeks kind of cycle, it was felt. It, it, it was felt. I'm still really upset though that Genshin hasn't included the quality of life changes, especially now with the release of Honkai Star Rail, that very evident changes could have been made to Genshin, but they were just not. And in my opinion, I think that the gameplay state wasn't really touched by Sumeru, it didn't really innovate anything. Like, some quality of life changes happened, yes, but it wasn't massive enough to really shake up the landscape of Genshin's endgame. Which is very unfortunate, you know? It is very, very unfortunate that we are stuck in AR-60 for god knows how long. Though, 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 I will say they were more generous with the rewards in Sumeru. Yeah, all in all, my problem with Sumeru is that there's a very, very big emphasis on more equals good. Now, we move on to the events. The long-term gameplay of Genshin Impact, or the short-term gameplay of Genshin Impact. I think patch 3.x actually improved a lot of the story writing of the characters in the story quests. Like, yes, the event quests have always been good in my opinion, they've always been pretty great. But 3.4's Lantern Ride, 3.5's Wind Bloom, introducing Sino, Tignari, and Lisa back into Mondstadt, the event still spiraled into the usual gacha minigame, and I don't think that any amount of complaining is going to change that. The we did get Karibar, which is one of the most fascinating character stories. One of the stories that don't have Paimon. And actually gives us a very great moral question and a look into Conrians and what happened after the Cataclysm and how the Abyss began or maybe what the Abyss even is. I think that Karibar was a very solid addition to the patch and that is never going to change my mind. Sumeru is closing its doors very, very, very soon and 3.7 is 
is on its way. The live stream is going to be today and I think we only have 3.8 left, which is actually a few more months before we get Fontaine, but trust me, that is going to absolutely change because it is going to go by in a breeze. And the thing is, Sumeru has been a very solid patch. It has been consistent with its characters, its lore, the amount of content was massive considering that we got so many places. But a lot of the problems still lie with the lack of endgame content. There's no update to the Spiral Abyss, to resin refreshes. Yes, we have TCG, we have the Genius Invocation, but again, I would like to say that the Genius Invocation isn't really meant to be Genshin's endgame. Like, you don't play a combat game to play a card game. Now, overall, my final review of Sumeru is that the world was great, the characters are great, the music was fantastic, though it wasn't innovative when it comes to the actual gameplay state of Genshin, and it didn't really address a lot of the problems when it came to, well, the lack of endgame for a lot of players. But I guess that's just par for the course. And now, my final words for this as we close off Sumeru is that Fontaine is going to have a very, very high standard to beat, because the state of the game from Sumeru to Fontaine versus Inazuma to Sumeru were very different things. Yes, we're currently in the content drought where, you know, the patch is ending. It's perfectly fine. It happens for all the patches. But what I'm saying was that Sumeru was at some point for a lot of people, oh, if it was bad, they were just going to quit. Now that was Sumeru's hurdle, to improve the current state of Genshin. Fontaine's hurdle is to keep up the status quo that Sumeru has set for its release. Sumeru's release was absolutely fantastic, and the dialogue writing has actually very much improved, and the character stories have very much improved. I have full faith that Fontaine will be able to execute, and if not, I will be very disappointed. But I'm curious, what about you guys? I know that Sumeru is actually a bit of a hit or a miss, depends on the person that you're asking. For me, it hits really, really hard because, well, I'm a college student. Research is my life, kind of thing. But I know that our opinions are going to match so I'm curious if you're someone that doesn't like Sumeru in general or you don't like the things that happened from 3.x to 3.6 or 3.7 I guess if you're from the future put it down below I'm really curious um, if you disagree with anything because I know some people that don't like the arc and cross because it was too long you don't like the characters because they feel really funky so I'm genuinely curious what are your opinions and but that has just been my honest thoughts on Sumeru time to go back to HSR for a bit because I actually have been kind of burnt out <laughs>